Yes, I'm totally on. I'm so on. All right, uh, so this is kind of an interesting talk. Partly it came from me telling these stories about crazy things that happened to me getting ready for or right before conferences. And people are like, oh, you got to blog that. Or you gotta, that's a great story. And so I, I figured this was a, a time where I'm going to tell you some fun stories and also in the, in the context of getting myself out of jams using cross-platform and why I think it's actually kind of a real thing and not just a trick to do during keynotes or whatever. So this is a drama in three parts. We're going to begin with a prelude, which is the idealistic gentleman. So I've been interested and thinking there was possibility for cross-platform .NET and cross-platform just goodness for a long time. I've, uh, so this was from something I did back in, we actually started this in 2004. Um, I wanted to play with Mono. Way back then, actually, getting Mono set up on Linux to run an ASP.NET site was a weekend project, if you knew what you were doing, kind of. It, it took a little bit, um, at least for me it did. And uh, so there was a live CD. Back then, people, like CDs. Do I need to explain CDs? Do we have some <laughs> kids in there? Um, so they had these live CDs where you could just boot, you know, boot to a CD. And it had Linux on them. And so there was one called Knopix, K-N-O-P-P-I-X. And so I was talking with people and, and uh, uh, said, hey, it would be neat if we could like just build. So actually, Twitter wasn't around back then. So I wrote a blog post. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if? So it was basically a tweet. And I said, wouldn't it be neat if we could make a live CD with mono, pre-cooked, start it up. It's got MySQL. It's got everything all pre-configured. And it runs so that you can start writing your .NET code right away, you know, and, and um, spend less time fiddling and getting infrastructure going. This was one of my first, like, forays into, like, doing anything, like, uh, open source -y and distributing software. And I, I'm at work, and all of a sudden I'm realizing I'm getting tons of downloads, and I'm having to figure out how to host, like, a legal torrent and all this stuff. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but so I've, I've been, you know, thinking, like, we're almost there. Soon this is going to happen for a long time. There have been some like, you know, disappointments and setbacks. I remember at a Mix conference talking to someone. I'm like, why doesn't Microsoft just ship a bunch of open source stuff? Like, it's out there. Why don't they ship Paint.net? Why don't they ship this and that? And, you know, I got some like, I don't know if it's. It was at least the reality of the time. People were like, well, because there's all these liabilities and all this stuff, and you know, you could get, and and. A lot of it was just like the way software was shipped by Microsoft, right? So it's kind of like, well, I don't know. I still think it could happen. And, and then, you know, finally things are, we're getting this promise, right? People are saying like, yeah, you really can do it. And, and so it was neat to see, you know, if I can go out to the, the .NET site, so dot, dot .NET, which is kind of silly. But so if, if you, or you just, you know, Google for .NET Core or whatever. So, but here's here's you know what you see when you go to it. So you go to the .NET Core site and you have all these different things. Plus, there's the other downloads, and you can click over and you can get other downloads, right? So that is neat. Um, so you know, like I started playing around with it. So I said, uh, let me see. So I don't know why it is, but I mix up two commands on a Mac and Linux. I always type MD because I think that makes sense to make a directory, right? And then I should just alias it, but I don't. On Windows, all the time in the command prompt, I'm always typing ls. And again, I should alias it, right? But I don't. Or I could just run bash here. But so um, I can do something like on here, I'll say, uh, so it's an empty directory. I'll say yo, ASP.NET. Um, and I'll, I'm using yeoman. I'm going to create a simple directory, or a simple application. Right, and what's cool with this is, I almost typed ls again, um, that there's a Docker file in here, right? So this, wow, that was neat. It's like, it's just kind of sparkly, isn't it? <laughs> oh, there's a matrix part coming up, so hold on. Okay, so, so there's a Docker file like included in these scaffolds, right? So I can go in, I can say like .NET, Restore, and I can run this locally. Of course, this is just running on Windows. Um, but when I'm running Docker, this is actually running in a VM, right? This is this Moby Linux VM. So that's how Docker is running on, on Windows. And, 
and so that's that is neat. Um, so let's see if that's done. Okay, so I could run this here, of course, but I can also say dot net or sorry, Docker build dash t, and so I'm tagging it with a name, and we'll call this monkey face, and so. I've tried, I was wondering why do I call everything monkey face or monkey or spaghetti, and, I, and the only reason I can really think of is I do that so that I know I can delete those directories, that's, or just because I have Tourette's, I'm not sure, but. So okay, so that's going through, and it's building an image, and then once that's done, I can actually, I actually have my Docker commands, because I might like explode my laptop. Um, but so that is actually building it in that Docker container, right? And now I can do docker run dash d dash p. So dash d is daemon and p is port. And I'm mapping 8080 to 5000. So what's happening is, and then it's monkey face. So what, what's happening there is I'm, I'm telling docker to run the image I just created, well, monkey face. And I'm saying run it as a daemon, so keep it running, and then mapping. The internal port, the application's running on 5,000. I'm mapping that to 8080 as, a, as an external. So now if I go here, and so hopefully that's spinning up, right? So, so that actually in and of itself is kind of wild, right? Because I built on Windows, I, I scaffolded something, but then I'm actually running it in a, Linux VM running on my laptop, and then I'm actually, you know, like calling back into it from Windows, and I'm already getting dizzy, right? So that, so that's neat. Now let's talk about uh, how this got a little more fun. Uh, so I was going to, I was invited, as many of these stories start for me, I was invited because somebody wanted Scott Hanselman to speak. <laughs> <laughs> in Moscow, right, at Moscow DevCon, and, and, uh, which is a cool conference, it's a really cool conference, and Scott was busy, and so then I was the third or eighth choice or whatever, so, so I fly over there, and I'm ready, right, I'm excited about this, and some of the stuff they were talking to me about was like, I want you to do the, the, um, the Azure keynote, right, this is, I think my name's up there somewhere in Russian, and I spoke Russian fluently, uh, no, but I did have a translator, which was cool. So, like, if you watch this on Channel 9, it's like I have this deep Russian voice. <laughs> so, um, so I was going to present on some things, and they had some things that they, this was the second day keynote, and they had some stuff they wanted uh, me to talk about. One was publishing uh, ASP.NET Core App to Docker Swarm on Azure Container Service. I'm like, I know some of those words. That sounds great. <laughs> well, we can do this. And <laughs> so I'm... I, I, you know, practice, got everything ready. Um, the, day, the day before the conference started, I actually, when, when I booked the travel, they said uh, there's some weird thing where for whatever reason, the, the Ritz uh, right on Red Square has an incredible corporate rate for Microsoft right now. And you can, you can stay there at the Ritz. I'm like, oh, that's all right, I won't argue. So I'm at the Ritz the day before the conference, and there was actually, that night was a tech check. Going through my slides, going through my demos, sipping some coffee, all of a sudden, the world's hugest sneeze just attacks me out of the blue. You ever had one of those? Like the sneeze where it, you know, it was bizarre. And coffee flying in the, where, in the air, and it was like, no. And the coffee spills right on the laptop, right? So then I go over and I'm like, it's, I'm sure it's fine. And I type all the keys, everything's M doesn't work. Well, there's no M in Docker, and I won't use monkey face, but I can make it. Ooh, now the N key's out. Oh, dot net. Dot, dot, oh. Pretty, one by one, the keys stop working, right? This is on my Windows laptop. It's the morning of the tech check. The next day, the conference starts, and I'm on the second day keynote, right? Freaking out. What am I doing? I flew all the way over to Russia, and, like, and, and then I'm like, can I go buy another laptop? And then I remembered that I actually in my bag also had MacBook Air. And I just always bring both with me because partly when I do um, ASP.NET demos and stuff, I wanna be able to show things working on both, right? But I done it, all my demos were in Visual Studio, all, everything was in PowerPoint, I'm like, is this even gonna work? Well, it has to, right? So I decided to you know, see if 
in a few hours, I could switch everything over, right? So I did that, and I actually ran through all of this stuff again this morning, just because, I don't know, it was reliving the memory. Um, let me see if I can do this. So what I'm gonna show you is creating and publishing a Docker, just like we did on the Windows laptop. We're gonna do that on Mac, but we're also gonna publish to Docker Swarm. You guys are worried I'm gonna like drop the laptops, right? Okay. okay. So, let's bring up, right, okay, so. I just love typing LS, why is that? Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, make a directory. Great, oh, it exists, monkey face exists, okay. Um, super monkey, okay. It's either that or poop, right? And I'm just not stooping to that level. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to scaffold out something, so I'll do, uh, again, yo, ASP.NET. Now, I actually ran through this morning doing this using Steve Sanderson's really cool ASP.NET Core SPA scaffolder, and it's, it's great, and it deployed to Docker, but it did take about a fortnight because it also has to, like, the Docker image has to build Node and it has to build all these other things, right? So this, I'm doing this because it's just a little faster, right? So. This is Yeoman Scaffolder, and I'm going to do, to keep it simple, all this stuff. So again, um, this, is, this is pulling things down. Also, the new, um, the new scaffold, the new templates don't have NPM. You don't have to use NPM, right? This just uses Bower, which I was kind of going back and forth on what I thought about it, because um, I kind of like Node and NPM, but it does, in this case, there's no restoring, it's super fast, so it wins today for me, so. Yes, okay. So here we're popping this up again, and I showed you that Docker file really quick, but I didn't, we didn't really look at what's in there, right? So it's actually pretty simple. It's, let's see if I can remember on here, thanks. Right. So there's an official, uh, can you see that? Great. Okay, so there's an official, like out on the Docker Hub, there's this a .NET image, right? So all that this does is a script, and it just says copy from my directory to this app directory in the, in the container, sets the work directory, it runs .NET restore, which is a standard .NET restore command, and .NET build, and then these last two, then it exposes that 5,000 entry point, and then it runs, .NET runs. So you can actually read this and it makes sense, which is nice. Um, great, so um, I'm going to, what do I wanna do? Let's do .NET Restore. Cool. So I can restore and run this. You've seen this probably 90 times at this conference, so I'm not gonna run it locally. It's the standard ASP.NET scaffold. What I do wanna do is first we'll do Docker version. Do I need to bump up the font size or is this, does this work okay? All right, so what we're seeing here is up at the top is the client. That's what I'm running there. That is not the latest thing which you just saw it pop up and tell me to upgrade, but it's good enough for me to, for, for today. So that's the client. The server is my uh, Docker server, which is also running on here. It's a, it's a VM, right? So it's just, it's running locally. Um, there's a whale that proves it. So I can go in here and I could say, uh, again, Docker build. Um, So it's building that. I think it's gonna be, <coughs> it's a little bit faster because I've I sort of cheated. I've built similar image on here today, and so there's, there's less for it to build. But also since it's building off of just that 
that standard image, it doesn't have to do a bunch of app get. That's something that slows down a lot of these. So, all right, so OS 10 laptop with a Linux VM. It's doing this restore stuff in the Linux VM. It's about to run. Then I gotta remember my command again, all that DP business, so I'll say, And what'd I call it? Thank you. All right, so let's go over here. All right, so that's not all that exciting. What we are gonna see, like it spins up, great. You know it would work. No excitement there, so we'll stop it. Um, What I do want to do next, though, is I want to show it running in the Swarm, the Azure, uh, Azure Container Service Swarm. So what that, what that does, and again, this is one of those things where it was frustrating because it takes just long enough where you wouldn't want to sit there and watch it go, but it's just fast enough where you're like, I almost could, right? So what I did is I went in here and I said new, and in this marketplace there is, in recent, I've got Azure Container Service, and you go through and you click, you fill in a few things. You say create, you click the only button you can, and then you go through and you set some basic like your SSH key and your username and that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then it spins up and it took uh, under 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes, something like that, okay? So that's, that's what I spun up and you can see that right here. Okay, so it actually does spin up a good amount of stuff, and this is a test swarm, so it's, it's actually not a, a big swarm, it's just for testing. Um, they have other ones that, that are larger, right? So there's that. So <coughs> what I'm gonna do, I already set up my SSH, so if I do, um, let's see, uh, export, and I forget, it's export, copy and paste, so what I'm doing here is this is just setting an environment variable that is telling the Docker host where it connects to. So now if I do Docker version, it's gonna scare me. It should be connecting to that other one, but Make sure I have internet and stuff. I, I was clicking around on there. I'll do Google just for John. Yeah, I've got internet. All right, let's see. Error occurred, not cool. All right, let's make sure I'm SSH'd. Okay, so now we can export it. Good, okay. So the important thing we're seeing here is my client is the same, that's where I'm connecting from, but my server now is Swarm. So like really all I did, there's a tutorial here on the Azure, um, Azure site, but all I did in order to do that is I've SSH to it, um, to this container service, and then I just say, you know, then that's it, right? So now, if I do the same kind of thing, if I say uh, Docker, Build. Uh, that should be it. Build from a Docker file. So there's my Docker file. Oh, dot. There we go. Cool. So this is doing the same kind of thing. It's going through. It's building an image for me. And then I can run it. So we're waiting here well on, like up in the magical clouds, it's installing these things, right? So we're SSH'd in so we can see it. It's installing the NuGet packages somewhere. So here it's running 
instead of like npm restore, it's that bundler minifier core. So that's a new tool that shipped um, that came in just at, at RTM. Um, so you still can run npm if you want to, but you're you're not required to it. In this case, I'm happy because it is really darn fast. So now I can do Docker um, dash d p and what do I call it? Spaghetti. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to go over to here. Here. So this is the URL of a Docker swarm. So this is a swarm. In this case, I think there's just one in the swarm. Uh, so it's not a large swarm, but it could be like any size, right? I can add multiple into it. So what we just saw there, I spun, I created that that Docker swarm this morning in about five, 10 minutes, and then I just now created a site and published to it, right? So I can go and do all the, I can go in and command the swarm. I can, uh, so now if I say, right, there's, there's the running application. I can go through and, and kill it or whatever. So that is kind of cool. And that got me through the Moscow conundrum. Any questions, thoughts so far? Good, everyone's so quiet. Right, okay. <coughs> Next, the case of the curious cursor. So I got back from Moscow, I was kind of tired, and I didn't have a huge amount of like stuff lined up, and I was kind of enjoying the quiet month, and then, um, Scott Hunter contacted me, uh, so Hanselman's boss, he contacted me and, and said, um, hey, do you want to go to Red Hat? Because we're, we're launching, you know, uh, .NET Core. That, that sounds fun. You know, do you have anything for me to do there? And like, ah, there's a booth, you know, it could be fine. Just hang out and have fun. So, oh, that sounds great, you know. So the, this was exciting. We we're, were launching it. Um, you know, it was a big thing, Red Hat. That sounded fun. Um, this is actually the booth while we were there. I was surprised, I was wondering what the reception would be like. I was thinking, you know, people are be, gonna be like not happy we're there or something, I wasn't sure. People loved us, people, it was tons of, now we were giving away penguins that said Microsoft loves Linux and they liked that. There were also water bottles down here and people loved coming to get those until somebody stole them all, which that's not cool. But, um, but anyhow, these are guys from the, the .NET team and uh, so we had a great time. I actually, I, and for a little bit, I couldn't really, like, it didn't make sense to me, but then it totally made sense to me, right? Because Red Hat Enterprise Linux, these are people that are running like enterprise jobs, and, and they, there were a lot of cases where, where they're like, hey, I would love to be able to run .NET, but you know, we're, this is our, our shop runs, um, runs Linux, but like the whole kind of enterprise Linux and, and .NET and, and Microsoft stuff. We, we also were launching um, SQL Server on Linux there as well. And so people, we had tons of people coming up from all these you know, big universities and, and um, NASA and all kinds of stuff that, that they were excited to talk to us. So, so yeah, exciting. Um, so, but I'm just kind of getting ready and I'm like, I'm gonna go hang out at the booth and give away penguins and that'll be cool. And then a couple of weeks before, week and a half, two weeks before the conference, I started getting copied on emails that said stuff like, yeah, make sure Galloway knows about this. And I'm like, what, what's up? And they're like, yeah, for Hanselman's keynote, you're, you're on that, right? Um, okay, yeah, you know, I like, so, so pretty soon I'm writing Hanselman's keynote, right? And, and learning Red Hat and, you know, like trying to make a keynote up, which, is, which was totally fun, but also like, like Red Hat, anyone here know Red Hat much? Use Red Hat? It's interesting, right? It's kind of cool, but it's like it's locked down in ways that are different than ways I'm used to uh, Linux being locked down. <coughs> and so learning about software collections and all this stuff, and it was, so that was cool. <coughs> and uh, so I ended up, you know, like working, it was, it was getting kind of, it was busy. Um, and, then, um, and then Hunter was like, hey, you can co-present with me, and we're doing this talk on like, 
running, you know, .NET on Red Hat and like running on on the their public cloud and all, or their um, PaaS system and all this. I'm like, that sounds fun, you know. And then I was kind of emailing him and I wasn't hearing back. And pretty soon he's like, yeah, crazy swamp, but you know, maybe we'll connect on the phone or whatever. And so it's getting closer and I'm getting a little like, are we good on this talk? And then, then like maybe four days before, he like emails me, he's like, I can't go. You gotta take the talk. So, <laughs> so and I, this was one where I was planning on like hanging out on the side being like, yeah, yeah, you go, that's cool, you know? And so all of a sudden I'm like, all right. You know? <laughs> so now I'm like writing, you know, the demo for Hanselman's keynote, which was which was fun, and we got to show tons of cool stuff, but it was a lot to do. And then I'm also like having to learn about um, about Red Hat, and also there, there's this thing called OpenShift, <laughs> which is is really neat actually. It's their their um, platform as a service. It runs on Red Hat, and it is um, it's using Docker and Kubernetes under the hood. So it's like it all kind of like the parts fit together, and it's pr it was pretty neat. Um, .NET running on Docker, anyways, and it's so. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, you know, working on that and stuff. Um, so we get through the um, we get through Hanselman's keynote. That was that was fine. And then I basically had to write my talk for um, for the next day, which was the the previously Hunter now me talk. So that was cool, and and a, a lot of it was on Red Hat OpenShift. And and as you can see from here, it's like it's now supported, right? Except. That was like the day that it was announced, and it actually wasn't supported, but nobody told me. So, <laughs> so I seriously stayed up the entire night, like, these commands are supposed to work, and it's not working. <laughs> and it turned out, like, basically, I could have almost done it if I had been able to publish to Docker, to Docker Hub, except they had, like, this, then I was like, oh, I should have done that. And I'm like, I actually worked with some of their engineers the next day, and, they're like, yeah, but we actually disabled that. You could for security, you know, we're not like allowing people. So, so that was a futile quest. But got through all that. I'm like, okay, here's I can talk my way around that. And then I, um, then I, was getting right up to my thing, to my talk. And actually, I'll switch back over while we're doing this. And I was going to be running on uh, a VM, running Red Hat. And the, the, the cool thing about it is that actually, for the most part, it's the same thing over and over again, right? So installing and running .NET on other platforms, you still, you get the framework. You do, you do the standard like .NET build, .NET restore, or uh, restore and then build, right? But uh, where'd it go? Just a second. So kind of the, the standard thing. There are some interesting differences, right? There's, uh, like I said, you have to, in order to install on Red Hat, you have to basically give yourself permission. Are we on? Yes, cool. Let's get ahead. But the exciting thing here, actually, I guess I could show you that first, right? So here's my Red Hat VM. And in this case, I just had to make it green type on black, just just for old school. So, um, so here's you know here's an example one. I can bring up code, right? So VS Code works on here as well. Um, so I can go through and <coughs> and build my app. That, you know the same thing. There's a Docker file. I could make you go through watching that again. Um, but the interesting thing here. So if I go. Um, Right, so I'm going through, and this is the standard. Uh, let's go 5,000. Cool. Great. Okay, so you know your standard MVC site. The exciting thing that I found out, though, and it was roughly 45 minutes before my talk, and I was in the hotel still, maybe closer to an hour, is I wanted to go full screen because this it was not very big and I had to present on a small thing. So I tried some different buttons and I ended up hitting Control-Alt, and someone said Home was what I needed to do, 
in order to get full screen. And I hit Control Alt F8. And that's exactly what I saw. And then I tried hitting other Control Alt things. And that was my screen. So in this case, it wasn't completely .NET Core to the rescue, but I actually did freak out and try installing on pretty much anything in sight. Um, I tried, you know, the press any key solution. Um, actually, <laughs> I found this out after, after the fact. Um, I, well, I found it out actually as I was searching, but it didn't totally work because the way the Hyper-V was mapping the keys back in. But did, did people know about this? Is there people laughing when I did this? Like, of course you did. But <laughs> control alt and then higher number F keys switch you to a virtual console, which is super useful in probably some cases that I don't know about, but it was not useful to me at the time. And then again, like I was saying, people, I actually was freaking out on Twitter. I'm like, how do I make the screen not be black with a cursor in the top? And then people are saying, just hit this and this. But because of the way Hyper-V was, uh, like, you know, like Hyper-V was grabbing some of those keystrokes on the way in, and so it was not working. So I started thinking, what can I do? Um, and so uh, I, I started, I had the, the MacBook with me and I installed on a VM on there, I started installing, which actually there's a process. It takes a little while to install Red Hat because um, there's like a license thing and there's like, there's things that have to happen. So I tried building another VM on here. I also started spinning up an Azure VM at the same time because 45 minutes, right? And, and then also uh, OpenShift, right? I started trying to deploy in case they had their, their image, uh, like the security enabled for it now. Um, but actually what I ended up doing was just rebooting the, um, the VM and then rebooting my laptop like nine times. And then eventually on the ninth time it actually worked. So I think I'm pretty fast. Uh, I thought that the, um, the Docker Swarm thing would take longer. This is really kind of wrapping up here. So if you have thoughts or questions, I'm happy to take them. But thoughts on kind of what this means and, and, um, and why I think it's important. So first of all, it's great that I can run .NET pretty much everywhere. And I love, as a developer, not just being able to do one thing, but to be able to run, you know, like, oh, I can work on that computer, or I can help you with this program, or whatever. I can spill coffee wherever I want, and it seems to be working out for me. Um, I do think it's neat that I can build on one computer and deploy to another. And actually, you saw me do that over and over today, right? Because I'm building on, on Mac and deploying to a Linux VM. I'm building on Windows and deploying to a VM. I'm build, deploying to the cloud. So really, that portable code is, is great. Um, and another thing I was, I was talking, I mentioned this to Steve Sanderson the other day, and he's like, well, don't forget also the, the importance of being able to have a team and everyone builds on whatever they want. And in fact, like um, Steve, for instance, most of the time he's always on his Mac and he's building a VS Code and, and he's deploying to stuff and I'm pulling it down and running it in Visual Studio. Like it doesn't matter, right? And I, I'm sure probably a lot of you that have worked on web dev teams, you end up uh, where all the designers are on Macs and maybe some of the developers are on you know, Unix and some are on Windows and some, like again, it doesn't matter. And that's been frustrating for me in the past where we were all working together on things and the, the designers could not get at the code or they couldn't run the application or whatever, right? Um, and, and then finally, a, a really big thing for me is not having to choose. So I think, I think that there's a difference between, between choices and options. And I love to have a lot of options, but I don't like to be forced to make choices, right? So <laughs> if you have to make a choice, it's like, I'm only doing this thing or I'm only, and especially, I think as developers, we do that a little too much. Like we say, I am a database developer, or I am a Windows developer. I only do Windows. Or I'm a Mac developer. I am a this or that, right? I'm a C Sharp dev. And I think it's great to be a developer that like, you can go anywhere and, and enjoy working wherever you'd like. That's actually all I got. That went way faster than I thought. Does anyone have any thoughts, questions? Yes. <laughs> uh, 
what, what aspect of cross-platform.net still frustrates me the most? Um, okay, this is just off the top of my head. So that, that, I think one thing is there, there are cases where you feel like there's a lowest common denominator where we still need to kind of build up to. I do see that moving pretty quickly, um, but that is something. There, I wouldn't call it a frustration, but there is just a thing to know about, which is there are slightly different steps involved, right? So like, um, like as I was showing, there's, but you know, that's just, that's how the platforms are, right? So like, here's the thing, if I go into um, Red Hat, like I've got to enable script, subscription manager and I've got to, so there's some places where like, to get open SSL on a Mac, you, you know, you go through and you like, how do you get that? How do you, so I think those are some things that are still kind of being worked out. Um, yeah. I don't know, those are really kind of, any thoughts for you? Uh, my recent frustration has been uh, bundling native binaries for yes. all the different things. Yeah. But that's just, you know, what I happen to have been doing recently. Yeah, that's incredibly frustrating. And, you know, I run into that all the time, like on Node as well, right? Like, if you're doing Node on Windows and, and you run into anything that uses Node or NPM JIP, you know, and it's, you're like, oh, is it gonna build this time? So that's, I think, um, my hope is that we get to, like the more of, of the stack that is managed, a lot of that kind of goes away. So, um, yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, yeah? Do you feel that um, .NET Core is ready for production? <clears throat> so, yeah, the technical answer is yes. I mean, it's, it's released. Now, the, the qualifiers on that are, the tools are still in preview. So what does that mean? The tools are like Visual Studio, you know, like any of the kind of command line tools, including are, those are still in preview. Um, the tough thing with that, with the, what the team kind of decided, and the, my personal thoughts on this too, it had been kind of in this not release state for years, right? It was in this kind of, was a beta, and then it was RC, and then it was like maybe should have been beta again, and then it was like, it's, but, Eventually, like, you get into the spot where you're waiting for, like, people aren't gonna ship database drivers and people aren't gonna, like, port their large systems to it and start actually doing things that make the platform useful until it releases. So you need kind of to say, like, okay, it's time we're releasing and then you go, right? It's never gonna be the perfect time, but it has to happen. I feel like, for me, <laughs> I've been, like, playing with it since it started. So I'm kinda like, is this still not released yet? You know, so, so, I mean, technically, yeah, it, it depends. It's, it's got to be, so it's, it's up to you because it is a version one product. So, I don't know. Thought, is anyone here running in production, running .NET Core in production? So I do talk to people. There are like some early adopters that are doing some pretty cool things with it, right? But it really kind of depends on what you're running, what your stability is. If, and, then, and then there's the whole kind of like, we have this big slide to show like, is .NET Core even, like if you've got working existing code that's deployed and running on .NET full framework, what's, what's your motivation to, to move to it, you know? And I, I think it is a, a better thing where if you're starting a project today, I would, I would consider it. Yeah. So, cool. Uh, you spoke briefly around uh, in your blog post from the open, the attitude towards open source at Microsoft. Yeah. Quite some years ago, what do you think kind of caused that shift in attitude from your perspective? Scott Guthrie. No. <laughs> well, the, I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, so, I mean, definitely having leadership move up over time that does believe in it, believes in open source, and sees it as a as a, a real legitimate like. Um, business, you know, like it's good business, right? Um, I think also seeing like the entire industry has kind of figured out good ways to, um, to use open source and to contribute to open source, not just like take from open source, but also contribute to it, so that's been good. I think also some things like, you know, there were some baby steps at Microsoft where we started shipping jQuery, you know, which actually sounds like nothing now, but that was a huge thing because we actually, by shipping this code, then we had to support it. And we had to, like, if something came up and, like, there were, there still was the, the, 
you know, people worry about, like, what if something in jQuery is actually found to be covered under some patent, and now what, what does that mean? We have DVDs out there printed, you know, with MSDN subscriptions, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think, you know, then over time, um, you know, Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, there are a lot of people inside of Microsoft that actually were kind of pushing pretty hard for it. There's also, over time, there's just, there's turnover at any company, and there are more people coming in saying, like, everything I did in college was open source. Why can't we, do, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it seemed like some kind of successes over time. And then MVC, that was also, at the time, that was a big deal for that to be open source. And it worked, you know. It was, um, so, so that, <coughs> also over time, we kind of trained the, the legal department, you know, that like, and, and so the, the legal department, like you, we bashed on them enough times, and there, there are some great people on the legal team that are, that are um, wanting to see how they can help with it, you know. So uh, now, a lot of the time inside, inside Microsoft, and it depends which group you're in and stuff, but the kind of default assumption is you're gonna open source something. Like, you know, so, especially with developer products, you know, but so that's gotten a lot easier. There's some, some quick, um, as long as you stay within some certain guidelines, there's some really, there's like a fast path to open sourcing things. So, yeah, I, so it's a combination of a lot of things. It's really something, I've been at Microsoft six years, actually. So my, people have an alias at, at Microsoft. It's like, you know, and, and like the dorky people like call them, call each other by their aliases and that's how you know they're dorks. So mine is J-O-G-A-L-L-O-W which is kind of stupid, and I was like, it doesn't matter. People are telling me you should change it. I'm like, I'm not gonna be here long enough. I'll be here a year or two, like, it's a big company. So it's six years later and I'm still there. And, and a lot of why I'm still there is because all these crazy things are like, it would be so great if they would just do this, like all that stuff kept happening, right? <laughs> so, so maybe I should change my alias. Um, but yeah, any, yeah. Great questions, by the way, thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, have any of the .NET core team done any performance benchmarks on the different operating systems? And has there been any like, consistent difference between the different operating systems profiles in that regard? <laughs> so yes, there's a huge, uh, so the, the main one, the obvious one, is the um, ASP.NET benchmarks. Um, and what we're seeing there is it's basically, a, it's pretty much a draw. So if we look at, <laughs> and there, there is newer stuff here, but we were seeing 1.1 million on, on uh, ASP.NET Core on Kestrel on Windows and on Linux, 928,000. And there are cases with, with some of the perf stuff where we'll see faster on, on Linux. So, you know, it really kind of goes back and forth. They do have, I was talking to Damien, I don't, I don't know more about this, but there's a whole perf lab and all they do is like they have these huge beefy machines and they'll do things like on check-in, they'll run perf tests. So um, really the goal is not to have things like, you know, there's always a thing of like, oh, of course Microsoft's gonna make it like suck on Linux and so you have to use it. But I mean, I see that still regularly on Hacker News, you know, it's like, what are they trying to do? I know there's something evil going on. Um, but you know, really it's, it's, it's um, make it, work as fast as, as possible. I'm sure there's gonna be some places where due to the, you know, some differences just in the process model and stuff on Linux where there'll be places it'll be faster and that's, that's fine, you know, that's, so, cool. Other thoughts, comments? All right. Well, thank you for your time. I, I uh, this was definitely a quicker one than I expected. Um, I thought my demos would kind of fail and they, didn't, so I <laughs> guess I shouldn't. Um, so, so thanks, that's it. <laughs>